We're truly blessed this morning to be gathered in the house of the Lord and special thank you to all those who've taken part in the service this morning. I feel the, the spirit um, of the Lord leading this morning in a, in a special way this morning. I do desire your prayers as I present the gospel this morning. This is a subject that uh, became heavy for me as I was studying and you can ask my wife, I was like very distracted about a few things that should have been normal, simple tasks for me. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was quite distracted with uh, some of the things that you know, I normally take care of. But as I, as I considered in, in sharing the, the message this morning, um, I find myself uh, this message is for me this morning. I find myself in this message and asking the Lord, what would you have me to do? What is your desire for my life? As you've called, as the Lord calls us all to be accountable to Him, uh, how is that measuring up? How is it, how is it taking place in my life how is it taking place in your life do you see a blank screen up there it's a blank screen okay that's my title screen so I don't have a title this morning so I'm going to ask you to help me out okay this might seem a bit unusual for a speaker to ask for a title from the congregation uh, after the message is preached. But if you, if you would care to, uh, think about the message as, as the Lord's laid it on my heart and just write on a piece of paper what you would have titled that message. How would have you, what would you, what would have you titled the message? Before we get into the message this morning, I would like to show you a, a few idioms. And I trust this morning that you know what an idiom is. It's a literary term. Um, maybe you don't know, but you will know in, in a few minutes. Hopefully you can see what I see here. Um, I'm not sure why my screen does that. Why did it? There we go. Okay. Now, kind of stole my thunder a little bit there, but now you know what an idiom is. Okay. Um, not to be confused with idiot in any way, shape, or form. Uh, an idiom, as you can see the definition there, is a group of words established by using usage as having a meaning not deductible from the from those of the individual words. Okay. So. Let's, let's review a few of these, okay? Here's two of them. These are, these are some of the things that we use on a regular basis, okay? We use this uh, in everyday language, a blessing in disguise, okay? You, you see the meaning there. Uh, diamond dozen, that's something we use quite a bit as well. Um, something that is very common, not unique. Uh, this one here, I'm not sure if you, we use this a lot in everyday life, uh, but sometimes we're beating the dead horse okay we're we're giving time or energy into something that is ended or over 
Um, that's, that's one to consider. Uh, sometimes that happens and we don't realize it till we get good and thoroughly frustrated with it. <laughs> best of both worlds. This is, this is, this is one that, that we like, right? We like the best of both worlds. The choice or solution has all of the advantages of two contrasting things at the same time. Now that's a good deal. We get the best of both worlds. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a good deal there. How about this one? Biting off more than you can chew. Uh, how about Thanksgiving? How did that go for you on your Thanksgiving meal? How about it? How about the second plateful? How did that go for you? Um, did you find out that you bit off more than you could chew? You had too much to deal with and you did not have the capacity to take on what was left on your plate. So you left it there, right? I trust you to enforce yourself. That, that's, that's, that's what the Bible calls gluttony. Uh, here's, here's another one. Uh, not sure where we're at here, but soon we're going to get into some, some biblical idioms that, that came from, that comes directly out of Scripture. And, and I found this quite interesting. Okay, here, that's the next one. Oftentimes we use, sometimes we use the expression, the 11th hour. In other words, waiting to the last minute to do something. Oh, waited to the 11th hour. Okay, yeah. It's the last minute to do something. Um, here you can see Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 20 and 1 through 16. Uh, quite interesting. At your wit's end. This was one that was new to me. Uh, sometimes we're at our wit's end. We don't know what to do. Or we don't know what the situation will bring. Read Psalm 107, 23 to 27. Quite fascinating that that is connected with this uh, idiom that we use on a regular basis. Now, the uh, here's one that, that is common. I think we use quite a bit. The blind leading the blind. Um, you, can, you can read through the scene. The, the words that are up there, Matthew 15, 14. Um, how many times do we, do we find ourselves in that situation? Uh, blind leading the blind. That's like me walking in darkness and leading Sophia behind me and we both fall over the same thing. Uh, that's what blind leading the blind is. Now that did not happen, by the way. But we, we did walk in the darkness to go hunting uh, a bit yesterday. And... Um, for me to make sure Sophia has a clean, uh, a regular, a good path, um, we use a light. If we hadn't used the light, it'd be a little more difficult to get to where we needed to go. But when the blind leads the blind, what is the end conclusion of it? Exactly. You both trip over the same thing. Um, it is a problem or you both both run into the same thing i can remember one time walking in the darkness with someone and i stopped and the person behind me didn't see me and we he piled right into the back of me well yeah when we, we were there we couldn't see what we were doing there was our view was obstructed okay let's go to another one the writing on the wall have you ever have you ever uh used this term the handwriting's on the wall what does that mean? The handwriting's on the wall. Now you can read through this up here and you can soon find out. But I got to this idiom as I was scrolling through um, on my computer. And by the way, just so you know, we haven't begun to touch all of them. There's three pages full of them yet. <laughs> so I selected a few. There's a lot of phrases that we use in everyday life, what do they mean? They mean something, yes. Uh, but as I, <clears throat> as I was scrolling through and I got to this one here and I looked at this one and I thought, wow, the handwriting's on the wall. And this got my attention. Uh, th that means that something happened and there's already a consequence for it. Uh, something happened and there's already a consequence for it and 
it hit me like a ton of bricks. My life is happening now. I'm living life. I, procre I proclaim to be a Christian serving the Lord. God knows the beginning of my life from the end. My finish is already written. God knows that. He knows what's best for me now. In light of my situation, God knows what is best for you. In light of your situation, where you are now, God knows the end. It's already written. Staggering thought. Staggering thought. Sometimes we get caught up with the here and now so much. We, we, just, we just can't get, a, get out of the here and now. And folks, this morning, we need to look to the future. We need to look at our lives as to what we are doing now and how it affects the future. I want you to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to go there for uh, a few thoughts from Daniel chapter 5. And I'm going to, going to turn this off here this morning and we're, we're going to be done with the the PowerPoint this morning so I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5 and we're going to review this the uh, the scripture here and we want to call our attention to uh, several things that took place in this chapter and I'm not sure we'll get through the entire chapter this morning but I do want to draw out a few a few points um, and if you're familiar with the Word of God and uh, a Bible, uh, our, and our Bible scholars, uh, you will you will understand the setting that is taking place here. Um, Nate, could you go back in the in the refrigerator? Give me a little bottle of water, please. You will understand the setting that's take, taking place here. So I'm not going to go back and and review that. Um, entirely. We're in the book of Daniel, and at this point in time, Nebuchadnezzar uh, has been off the scene as king here in Babylon, and Belshazzar is king. Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son, as we as we find on find out as we as we read on here in chapter five. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast. A thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden, gold and the silver, the golden and the silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and and his concubines might drink therein. And they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. Thank you, Nathan. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, and of wood and of stone. Now let's stop there and consider the verses here, what, what's taking place um, as, as we look at this here. Uh, Belshazzar is having a great feast and I'm not sure if it was just a feast to have a feast I, I'm not sure exactly what it was but I, I don't believe uh, that this was an uncommon thing I think this was rather common in the times which they they lived they enjoyed a lot of feasting and a lot of celebration and, and a lot of uh, festivity um, Belshazzar knew the way of Nebuchadnezzar his father and Belshazzar knew uh, what was to be uh, respected and what was uh, for him. In other words, he was not an innocent king here in this situation is, is what I'm saying. He knew what he should be doing and what he should not be doing. And we'll find that out later as we go on through the chapter. But here, here we find that he brings the golden vessels uh, drinking vessels and the silver drinking vessels that had been taken out of the temple in Jerusalem and he brings them out into uh, this feast and this celebration that he's having 
and he's allowing people to drink out of them and to use them and on top of that he deliberately praises the gods verse 4 it says the gods of gold notice that small g that's that's idols that we're talking about here the people had set up idols of worship and which was not which was not uncommon in this for this setting but he praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of stone a direct defilement of the holiness of god um a direct slap in god's face and as you as you can see that unfolding um, you realize that that does not go unnoticed that does not go unnoticed verse 5 it says the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote thus we have the handwriting on the wall What is God saying to you? What is God speaking to you? What is God speaking to me? Notice what happened in verse 6. It says, Then the king's countenance was changed. Oh, it was no longer the time of festivities. This got the king's attention. And his thoughts troubled him. Presently, he was just before this, he was acting like there was no care in the world. His thoughts troubled him and so that the joints of his loins were loosened and his knees smote one against another. My, the situation has changed. The king goes from being festive to ill. And this was before he ever realized what was written on the wall. But the king knew that he had violated what God had set forth as holy and to be used for his service and his kingdom and his worship. In the New Testament, we read about how we are to be temples of the Holy Ghost. And I think about this, this here, you know, do we become uh, in violation of what God has planned for us? If so, I trust that we recognize the handwriting on the wall and we make the necessary changes. But the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him. The king cried aloud to bring the astrologers of the Chaldeans and soothsayers and the king spake and said unto the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall we read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a, claim of, have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. A reward was given for knowing what was written on the wall. And the, the kings then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. And the king, Belshazzar, was tr greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. You know, sometimes when we, when we are guilty of something, we know we've trespassed or we know we've done something we shouldn't have. Our countenance changes. People notice there's something different about him. And here the lords were astonished, those that were close to him. What's wrong with the king? What happened? Belshazzar knew he crossed the line when he defiled the holiness of God. Did you ever hunt deer on, on private property? 
Uh, you don't have to answer that question. <laughs> That's rather personal. Um, I have already. Confession's good for the soul, right? This is many years ago. But you know, when I was on that private property, I was as nervous as a fly on a hot plate, if that's a term. I, I was as nervous as a, as a uh, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. it. Bothered me like crazy till I got off of that thing. Finally, I said, you know what, this isn't worth it. This is not worth being upset over or not worth the violation over some stupid deer that might be on this property that I can't access. And so I left. I got off of it. Um, and I was walking fast, too. <laughs> I didn't want anybody to catch me on it. I was walking fast. And as I, as I, as I think about this, and I, I think that's what the king was, he was on private property here. He was, he was messing with the holiness of God. You know, sometimes we lose sight of that. And we can't figure out what the problem is, and we can't figure out what's going wrong, and we're seeking advice for, for all, all kinds of things when it's as simple as leaving the private property and making things right uh, with whomever necessary. The queen comes on the scene and realizes there's a problem. Normally the queen is not at these kind of feasts, um, which is respectable. Uh, the queen comes on the scene and uh, tells the king, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in the kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods and in the days of thy father's light, in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, in whom King Nebuchadnezzar Thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Um, and we could read on here. But the queen comes on the scene and she remembers Daniel. And she remembers that God was with Daniel. And she remembers what, what Daniel uh, did for King Nebuchadnezzar. And how Daniel confronted King Nebuchadnezzar um, in, his, in his pride and his his lifted up spirit, you might say. Uh, and the king, the queen remembers this man. And she says, let Daniel be called. And I'm, I'm not sure where Daniel was at this point. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure where he was. But it says, let, da let Daniel be called. Um, and an interpretation will be given. And... Daniel comes on the scene. And let's go on down here to verse 17. And Daniel answered the king. Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known unto him the interpretation. Daniel has years of experience. You can see that in this verse. You can see Daniel's years of experience. Um, when, when, when you're in desperation, as the king was here, you're willing to do almost anything to get things right. When you're in desperation, you'll do almost anything to get it right. And the king here was desperate, and he was, he was dishing out all kinds of nice things. Um, but Daniel says, none of that. Keep it for yourself. Uh, give your rewards to another. And then Daniel goes on, and he interprets the writing on the wall. For King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, King Belshazzar here, and verse 22, Daniel says, O thou his son. In other words, he references Belshazzar's father in the, in the few verses that we didn't read. 
you might do well to read through uh, the verses here. But he references the, uh, Belshazzar's father uh, and tells him, O thou his son, you have not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all of this. And that's why the king was so distraught. The king knew what he was doing. Uh, he knew that he had crossed the line and he was, he was dealing with the guilt that comes with crossing the line. Verse 23, it says, But thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of this house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass and iron and stone, which see not, hear not, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath, thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified that's a sobering sobering verse uh, you talk about the the hand writing on the wall it's sobering for us to think about that as well folks when we know what direction God is asking us to go we know what God is asking us to do and we refuse we put ourselves in a dangerous position a dangerous a dangerous situation then he goes Daniel goes on and verse 24 he says then was the part of the hand sent before him and this writing was written and this is the writing that was written Mini Mini Tikal Pharisee this is the interpretation of the king Meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Prayas, thy kingdom, or Pharaohs, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. To put it simple, Belshazzar, you're weighed in the balances and you're found wanting. There's something missing in your life and thus it is numbered it is divided and is weighed, is measured. That thought struck me hard. How would it be if God weighed us in the balance? I trust you understand what I mean by balance. Heavier weight to one side, lighter weight over here. We're weighed in God's balance. Where are we? Where are we in God's eyes? As we're walking with the Lord, are we wanting? Are we lacking? It's a challenge to me. Verse 29 says, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a procl proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. What motivated Belshazzar to do that? Belshazzar was a man of his word. He had promised it to Daniel. And... Well, he promised it to whomever could interpret the writing. But he follows through on it. Verse 
a way of saying, Daniel, I know you're right. Verse 30, in that night Belshazzar in that night was Belshazzar king of the Chaldeans slain. And the kingdom was divided and given to uh, the kingdom was given to Darius of the Medians of Median. And it gives an age there. We're not sure about God's calling on our lives. We have a divine appointment with him someday. We're not sure when that will be. Give it some consideration. Give it some thought. What about your life? What about my life? Are we weighed in the balance and found faithful? Or are we weighed in the balance and found needy creatures? Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How's Jesus going to answer a question like that? The rich young ruler had everything. He made it. He was successful. And he was successful because he made sure he was successful. Talking about being financial. But you know, one of, one of his successes did not include his spiritual life. When God weighed him in the balances, he was found a very needy person on the spiritual side of life. Wow. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Was the question. You can read on. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse, beginning of verse 16. The story is also followed in Mark Mark uh, chapter 10 and 17 and also uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. Actually, Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, a lawyer asked Jesus the same question. A lawyer came up to Jesus and he asked the same question. And what did Jesus say? His answer was a little different than to the rich young ruler, but it basically, it weighed him in the balance. Jesus answered him in verse 26. He says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? In other words, Jesus returned the question about what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus returned the question to him. What is written in the law? Certainly a lawyer should know the law, correct? Yeah, he knew the law. He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This is Jesus speaking. Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Talking about being weighed in the balances this morning. Is God speaking to you? God has spoken to me. What are we going to do with it? As Brother Eli was sharing this morning in Sunday school and talking about 
the uh, uh, jailer in Acts chapter 16. Verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Paul and Silas again were waiting the balance, were they not? They were tested. And they were found faithful. Suddenly there was an earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosened. You can't picture in your mind what that scene must have been like. But you can try. Then Paul cried with a loud voice. Actually, verse 27, the keeper, keeper of the prison, on awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Who called for the light? The jailer did. Called for a light and sprang in and he, and he fell down before uh, Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, the jailer was weighed in the balance too. The jailer knew he was going to have to give an account for what had happened. And the jailer was rescued before it was too late. Belshazzar wasn't. Quite fascinating. When you read on, you can see how that, not just the jailer, but his household came to know the Lord. What a blessing of being weighed in the balance and found faithful. Not sure what happened to the rich young ruler. As I was studying this, I felt bad for him. he's like so many people in our world today in pursuit of the things that aren't really important I could see myself in, in him in a lot of ways if God is asking you to make adjustments to your life are you willing to do it are you willing to be weighed in the balance and to be corrected by God's gentle nudge, His Spirit leading. I trust this morning that as we've had this short time together that we've searched our souls And that we've made our things right with the Lord. If we haven't, I encourage you to do so. Pray with someone. Uh, meet with someone. And um, allow the Lord to work in your life. Because there will come a time when we will be weighed in the balance. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, it has been a blessing to be here. Father, I've been challenged this morning myself, and I pray that you would forgive me for times when I've maybe put other things in front of what your will is for my life. Lord, help me to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading. Father, thank you for the illustrations and the truths in God's Word that we can use to encourage ourselves and others in the Christian walk. Pray your blessing upon each one today as we've uh, 
would go about maybe visiting today or enjoying the Lord's day and relaxing. Lord, help us to be instruments and tools in your hands for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.